uh, as you say, we've all participate, most of us, all of us have participated in way too many Zoom meetings. And it, even though it, I think it'd be a pleasure to see all of you in person, uh, uh, we'll probably see more of you this way than we would if everybody returned to campus. But with all that out of the way, I want to introduce our esteemed faculty speaker, uh, Noelwa Natusel is the Stanley H. Cohn Professor of Economics, and her research has explored the effect of urban environmental conditions such as water quality, proximity to open spaces, vegetation, and green infrastructure on property sales. And um, her current research investigates the willingness to pay and she advises me that this is an acronym that's going to be discussed. She will use frequently as WTP. And this is a new TLA for me, but uh, she's gonna use it a lot. And uh, so this has to do with the consumer's willingness to pay for flood insurance and flood insurance literacy in general. Uh, so Noel Wah, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks so much for the invitation and for the, uh, the kind introduction. Congratulations to all of you. I really wish that we were in person. I was teaching this spring entirely online and I am longing to be back in a classroom. So part of what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share my screen and use my iPad. And so this is actually how I was teaching intro econ this past spring was by using my iPad in this great program called Notability. And I think you'll see some of the, the benefits and the fun and the, the learning that the faculty went through to try and make the transition to online teaching. So as Jay said, um, the talk today is gonna focus on climate change, flooding, flood insurance. I encourage you, we're a nice small group, that if you have a question for me, if there's something you want me to clarify, please just interrupt or you can raise your hand. And I'm just happy to take questions as we go along. So a, a little bit about um, what's going on with climate change and with a, a focus on Portland. So we know that climate change is gonna increase the frequency intensity of these really large storm events. And what we're seeing in Portland and what we're anticipating is that Portland's going to get hotter, it's going to get drier during the summer. And then during the winter, you probably as Reed graduates didn't think this could happen, but it's going to get wetter. And these rain events are going to become far more intense. Portland, like around 900 cities in the United States, has a combined sewer overflow system. And what that means is that sewage stormwater goes into the same pipe, when the system becomes overwhelmed, it ends up discharging untreated effluent. In the case of Portland, that's going into the Lambert, it's going into the Columbia Slough. And so partly in, in reaction to these CSO events, um, Portland has been extremely innovative. Um, it had to, as a result of litigation, install more traditional infrastructure, so gray infrastructure, $1.4 billion big pipe project, which was phenomenally expensive. But Portland has also been at the forefront of installing these more nature-based solutions. So if you've been to Portland recently and you've driven around, um, what you'll notice is that there are a lot of these green street facilities, and we have some of these on campus. We also have a green roof on campus. And that's partly a reaction to problems related to stormwater. And Portland, not only in the United States, but around the world is considered to be a leader in use of these more nature-based techniques. So that's one type of flooding that we're expecting to see in Portland. The other type of flooding is related to what's going on with rivers and streams, so fluvial flooding. Um, Portland, as you know, we're at the confluence of the, two of the largest rivers in the United States. Um, we're expecting that we're going to see increases in sea level rising. We're going to see these more extreme rainfall events, and that's going to contribute to more flooding in our, in our rivers, in our streams. All Oregon cities have an urban growth boundary. 
And so what that does is it really concentrates urbanization within a specific area. So we don't see the sprawl that occurs in some other parts of the United States, but it also means we have a lot of impervious surface area. And so increasing extreme rainfall events, a lot of impervious surface area, we're gonna be taxing our rivers and we're gonna be taxing our streams. Closer to campus, um, we are in the Johnson Creek watershed and the Johnson Creek watershed has a long history of flooding. And partly in reaction to that, there were a series of projects, part of the w, uh, WPA, uh, Works Progress Administration, that was an attempt to stop Johnson Creek from flooding. And so they thought if we line it, if we straighten it, it'll get the rainfall through there faster and it made matters worse. And so Johnson Creek's a very, very flashy stream. When it starts raining, you can just see the gauges going up quickly. And we have a history on Johnson Creek of lots of flooding and significant amounts of property damage. In reaction to that, the city of Portland, um, a lot of private property owners, the Johnson Creek Watershed Council, and in fact, Reed have invested a significant amount of money to try and restore the floodplain and to try and restore the ability for these riparian areas to function appropriately. And so the picture that I'm showing you, this is right after in uh, 2010, a restoration project was completed on the Reed campus. So this is the Ravelli farm property. This is the property that was immediately west of campus that the college purchased and then used old maps from when they were thinking about using the Reed Lake as a source of water for the city of Portland. They actually were able to recreate the meander of that stream based on, on those old maps. And so it's just this wonderful example on campus of restoring an area and trying to get it back to a more natural state. So this project is um, one that I've, I've followed for many years. So I commute down Foster to get to campus. So this area is east of campus. If you know where Interstate 205 is and Foster, that's the exit you would take off of 205 to get to campus. Here you'd head in the opposite direction. So this is Foster and 111th. And this area up here, that had been a housing development. There were 60 homes that were in that area. There were three streets, there were bridges. These homes every other year were being flooded. So this was a community that was, um, it was there, it was a cohesive community, but it was just constantly being confronted with nuisance flooding. And just every other year their homes would be flooded, the road would be flooded and foster. This is an important transportation corridor. And so this is something that the Bureau of Environmental Services, which is Portland's sewer and stormwater agency, um, saw as a priority. And so over a 15 year period, they had a willing seller program and they eventually purchased the 60 homes that were in that community. Um, those homes were removed, the streets were removed, and then they initiated a project to restore the floodplain. It's a 63 acre site. And what it did was it changed this nuisance flooding of once every other year on Foster to now it's expected to be once every six to eight years. So it's an improvement. It hasn't changed the problem of flooding that we see in this area. Um, but it just goes to show you that in order to address something like a hundred year flood event, you really need massive, massive projects. So this kind of infrastructure or trying to engineer the flood so that you can reduce risk is cost prohibitive. And it's just, it's, it's not something that's viable, especially not in this area. So one thing that occurred when BES was working on this project was that the staff members were becoming really familiar with the Lentz and Powellhurst Gilbert neighborhood and realized that that neighborhood not only suffered from flooding, but it also had some other challenges. So challenges of housing affordability, jobs, um, just resiliency in this community. 
And so that's something that feeds into the story in a couple of slides, but just keep that in mind that Lentz has flooding, but Lentz also faces some other challenges. So that leads me to the study that I'm gonna talk about, about the willingness to pay for flood insurance. And so commuting down Foster, being familiar with Johnson Creek and these efforts, I started thinking about that community and how people in that community were being challenged because of changes in federal legislation. They were seeing their flood insurance premiums going up by 18% per year, year after year after year. And I was hearing stories and people in the city of Portland were hearing stories of homeowners having to sell their homes. They were doing short sales. Homes were going into foreclosure. Um, an interview we had with a homeowner in that community, she told us she, she could only afford to pay her flood insurance premium by putting it on her credit card. And that she was really um, struggling to figure out, you know, pay my insurance or get my prescriptions filled. And so there's some real, real heartbreaking stories about what was going on in this community. And so that was part of the reason for launching this study, trying to understand the willingness to pay for flood insurance. And I want to acknowledge that um, this is work that was a collaboration with Carolyn Kuski and Howard Kunrather, who have longstanding and just incredibly deep knowledge about flood insurance, natural disasters. Um, Howard founded the Risk and Decision Center at Borden. And so the two of them are really considered to be leading authorities on flood insurance and, and risk. This is a paper that's forthcoming, and it was um, really made possible not only by the collaboration with Howard and Carolyn, but also the great work of two research assistants who graduated last year, so Will Daniel and Shula Rupani, who are co-authors on this paper. Sorry for the barking dog, negative externality. See, you can tell I'm an <laughs> environmental economist. I got it going on, my neighbor's dog, apologies. So I wanna talk a little bit about John Kutilla. So John Kutilla is um, an extremely famous economist, central to founding my field of environmental resource economics, one of the co-founders of Resources for the Future, which is the premier think tank in my field in DC. And one thing that John did um, amongst many of his contributions was he published this article. So the year that you graduated, this article came out in Water Resources Research. And what John mentioned in this article, and I've got a couple of quotes and I'll, I'll focus on a few things. One was this recognition that, you know, we really need to have a compulsory insurance program. So recognizing that we, we need to do this. We need to mandate that people should have flood insurance. The other thing that he mentioned, and the, the language he's using is a little bit dated, but it's kind of charming when I was rereading this, this idea of external diseconomies. So we would refer to that as a negative externality. And although he doesn't clarify what he means by that term, there are two ways that I interpreted that. One is that when you develop in a floodplain, you are increasing the amount of impervious surface area. So that can have effects further down. So if there's a negative effect on other people because of you building. The other effect that's occurring, and we see this in Johnson Creek, is we have listed species under the Endangered Species Act. And so building in a floodplain is having a negative impact on species. And some of those are, are listed species. The other comment that he made, and this comes as a result of a paragraph that I didn't include where he's talking about the challenges of putting this in place. So he's recognizing that politically, having a compulsory insurance scheme might not be feasible. It's gonna be hard to do. And so what he recommended was, let's, let's move in that direction. It's kind of nudge. It's almost a behavioral economics comment that he's making in saying that you know, we, we've been doing this for decades. It's going to take time to address this, but let's adopt policies and measures that, you know, tend in the right direction. And so again, this came out in 66, so 55 years ago. 
And when we talk about what's going on with changes to the National Flood Insurance Program, just reflect back on John's comments in, in this article. So a little bit about the National Flood Insurance Program. So there was a period when we did have private flood insurance in the United States. Um, there were some natural disasters going back to 1927, and those private insurance companies folded or decided we're not going to offer private flood insurance anymore. And so the federal government was on the hook, a lot of money spent trying to address um, significant disasters. And so 1966, Crutillo's article, 1968, we see the passage of the National Flood Insurance Act. And that act offered through the federal government um, flood insurance. It was offered at rates that were extremely favorable, so far below the expected cost. Um, but rather than seeing a lot of uptake, in fact, there were very few people who signed up for it. And so the 68 Act was changed in 1973, and that act mandated that flood insurance must be purchased if you're in a 100-year floodplain. And that's something that is part of a map that FEMA creates. So we have these flood insurance rate maps. So if you're in a mapped 100-year floodplain and you have a mortgage or a loan from a federally backed um, lender, you have to have flood insurance. And so Krutila's idea of having flood insurance be mandated is realized in 1973. This graphic that you're seeing on the side, so this comes from an article written by one of my, my co-authors, Carolyn. And what you're seeing there is that most policies that we see written in the United States are for single family homes or for condos. So when I'm talking about NFIP policies, that's really who you should have in mind. Um, there are some for non-residential, but that's a relatively small number of policies that we see. The other good thing to know is that what we're seeing in Portland, and this is true elsewhere, is that there are a lot of people who end up suffering from flood damage who are outside these 100-year floodplains. And in Portland, it's about half of the claims between 78 and 2014 are from people who are not in the mapped 100-year floodplain. So a little bit about our study area. So we were focused specifically on two neighborhoods in Portland. So I mentioned Lentz. Um, there's another one, Palhurst Gilbert. And these two uh, neighborhood organizations are where we see a good part of the Johnson Creek 100-year floodplain. So the areas that are in blue that you're seeing in this map, those are all part of the 100-year floodplain. And it, it surprises people when they look at this. So one thing that surprises them is that the 100-year floodplain isn't right next to Johnson Creek. It has to do with the topography of this area. You can be a mile away from Johnson Creek and you can be in a 100-year floodplain. This area up here is actually an ephemeral lake. So that's um, Holgate Lake that you're seeing that I've circled in yellow. And so people who are um, far away, and you, know, you can imagine that you know, somebody's looking to buy a house and they don't know the history of the area, they might look around their, their blocks, a couple of blocks, not see a creek and think, I'm good. You know, why would I think about flood risk? But you're a mile away. It just has to do with what happens when Johnson Creek overflows its banks. It ends up going down the roads. Um, the elevation is such that it, you can be far away and, and you're at risk. So that's one thing to note about the area. The other is the type of flooding that occurs. It's one to three feet. But if you have a foot of water in your house, that can create a whole lot of damage. So it's not the type of flooding that most people think about where there's a hurricane that comes in or a major river overtops its banks. This is very shallow flooding that occurs. And in my literature, it tends to be very understudied. It's not kind of like, ooh, that's exciting. You know, a hurricane came in, what happened to home sale prices? Um, so part of the reason for doing this was that this seems to be a very understudied type of flooding. 
I will point out, since I've got this zoomed in, in case you're wondering, like, where's Reed compared to the, the Lentz and Powellhurst Gilbert neighborhood? So this dot that I have there, that pink dot, that represents Reed. So um, people who are traveling to Reed or are um, in the vicinity, so looking around Reed or going down one of the popular um, bike corridors would be very, very familiar with this neighborhood. And a lot of Reed students end up doing volunteer work in, in this neighborhood, so they're quite familiar with it. So Southeast Portland, close to campus. So a few other things to know is that um, there are about 800 single family residential properties in my study area that are in the 100 year floodplain. These are very old properties. So these were properties that were built before the flood insurance rate maps were put into place. So when the NFIP went into law, one thing that was required was that cities create these flood insurance rate maps. And that's how you find out if you're in a 100-year floodplain. So 90% of my properties were built before people understood that they were at flood risk. And that ends up being an important part of the story and a, an important part of what we do for policies about homes in a floodplain. We also, when we were looking at census information for our study area, we have a lot of residents who are foreign born. They're not native English speakers. And we ended up designing a survey to account for that. Um, and we find some interesting results for people and their willingness to pay based on race and ethnicity. Compared to Portland, education levels are lower, poverty rates are much higher in the study area. So 23% of our study area is considered to be in poverty. Nationwide, when you look at the poverty rate for people in 100-year floodplains, it's 15%. So we have a lot of poverty in, in our area. And again, a lot of people who, if there's some type of flood event and they don't have flood insurance, they're not going to have savings to pull on to help recover from that. So a little bit about premiums, and these are all residential premiums in our um, zip code that most closely aligns with our study area. So some of the premiums you're seeing here are for people who are actually not in the 100-year floodplain. So you can get flood insurance even if you're not in a 100-year floodplain. And I'm guessing that some of these lower values are for people who are in what's known as the X zone but we have people who have single family residential properties. And these are very modest homes in the Lenson Powellhurst Gilbert neighborhoods where they're paying you know, over 3,000, over $5,000 per year for flood insurance. And again, these individuals as a result of changes in legislation in 2012 and 2014, we're seeing their insurance rates go up by as much as 18% per year. Um, and that would be a shock to many people, and in this particular neighborhood, it was um, particularly challenging for those individuals to see those premiums going up year after year after year. I do want to call out some really great things that the city of Portland and the state have been doing. So I mentioned that the Bureau of Environmental Services, when they were working on the Foster Floodplain Program, they realized that Lentz and Powerhurst Gilbert face multiple challenges. And that's not something that the sewer and stormwater agency can address. So they have their silo, um, but there are other agencies that work on housing, that work on jobs. In Oregon, we have a program called Oregon Solutions. And these are projects that are certified by the governor. And the goal is to be creative, to take challenging policy issues and to bring together state agency, federal agency, city agencies, academics, neighborhood members to try and address these questions. And so Lentz was certified as an Oregon Solutions Project. Um, if you go and you want to see, there's a website devoted to this. Um, my sabbatical lined up perfectly with the time period of this project. And so I spend a lot of time going to these meetings and really benefiting from what I heard from the neighborhood representatives. 
And then also you'll see I benefited from some modeling that was being done. The other thing that was going on at the same time is the Portland City Council authorized a, pil a pilot program called the Flood Insurance Savings Program. And that was a program that was run through Portland's Housing Bureau. And what it did was it allowed income qualified individuals to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with the most amazing flood insurance agent. I sat in on one of those consultations. She's extraordinary. She really, really knows what she's talking about. And she did an analysis of their flood policy, looked to see, is it cheaper if you go not through NFIP, but through a private flood insurance uh, company, and then reviewed policies for errors. And about half of those policies had some type of error. The other thing that the city council provided funding for is what's known as an elevation certificate. So remember, these are very, very old homes. 90% were built before the flood insurance rate map. And what that meant was that they had rates that historically had been heavily subsidized. The rates did not reflect the risk. As a result of the changes in federal legislation, 2012-2014, it actually was in their interest to have rates that reflected more detailed information about that property specific risk. And that's something that you determine by using an elevation certificate. So your flood risk depends on the elevation of your house and critical infrastructure and your base level. And so by giving the funding to allow residents to get an elevation certificate, it reduced premiums on average by over $700. And that meant the world for some of these homeowners in this study area. We also have a really fantastic state representative, big shout out to Representative Reardon, who um, convened, was a co-convener of the Oregon Solutions Project and realized that there were two things that he could help. Um, so he introduced legislation that required insurance agents writing flood insurance policies to have continuing education. And it might surprise you that Oregon is now only the fifth state to require that. Flood insurance, the details change a lot. Um, these are very challenging policies to write. And so if you're not writing a lot of them, which is true in Oregon, um, if you're not on top of it, you can see these errors and that's some of what was shown through the flood insurance savings program. We, this research group that I was part of with this paper, introduced testimony to support a second uh, piece of legislation that Representative Reardon sponsored. And that was to provide more detailed information about whether somebody who was thinking about buying a house was in a hundred year floodplain. We know when people are in 100-year floodplains, but seller disclosure forms are kind of not very detailed. Um, it was a yes, no, or I don't know. And when I did an assessment, I was seeing properties where a seller had said, yep, I'm in a 100-year floodplain. And then the new buyer, when they went to sell it, said, I don't know. And so this really puts buyers at risk. And you'll see some information we gleaned that showed that just this, this isn't working. So it was strengthened a little bit. It's still not as good as, as what I had hoped. So our motivation, and I've talked about this a little bit, um, if people do not have flood insurance, it really leaves them vulnerable. Um, it, and having, a flood event and then having insurance, you're gonna receive compensation a lot faster um, than the other, other options. And those other options are really quite limited. So we were interested in knowing what are people willing to pay, especially in the study area. And this is the first study of its type in the US to try and determine what people's willingness to pay is. Um, we also question, you know, if willingness to pay is below what people have to pay, then what can we do to try and make flood insurance more affordable so that everybody ends up having access to this? So the way that we did this was we developed a survey 
And this whole process of developing the survey, implementing the survey, this was about a two-year project. So Will and Shula, the two students, worked with me for two summers. And then actually during their, their junior year, during um, their senior year as well on this project. And what we did was we surveyed, sent a solicitation, please take our survey to every floodplain resident in our study area. And then we also reached out to about 3,000 other residents, so about 4,000 total. And we worked really hard to promote this survey. So we had a one in five chance of winning $20. We had a grand prize um, because we really needed to make sure we had enough observations and we really didn't, didn't want to hear from everyone. We had it translated into Vietnamese, Russian, Spanish. Um, we had this online. We had hard copies. I offered to like hand deliver this to people who you know wanted a copy of the survey, anything to try and get more, more input. And although a response rate of 11% might seem really low, survey response rates have declined dramatically. It's hard to get people to take surveys. This was not an easy survey. We asked a lot of detailed information about people's flood insurance, about their flood literacy, um, and about half of the people who received our solicitation to take the survey were likely renters. And this is a survey that really wasn't focused on renters, it was focused on homeowners. So we felt really good about that response rate. So one thing that I had access to, and this came out of the Oregon Solutions Project, was this objective risk analysis that was done by Gary Wolf, who works for OTEC Engineering. The flood insurance rate maps, so these are the FEMA maps that tell people you're in a 100-year floodplain in my study area, were really dated. So these are from 2004. And as you can imagine, the technology for determining if someone's in a floodplain has changed. The amount of urbanization has changed. Climate change is influencing flood risks. And so FEMA flood maps, and especially in our area, sometimes can be very, very dated, sending bad signals about, inappropriate signals about risk. And so Gary's work um, was using more up-to-date technologies to figure out the depth of flooding that would occur in different areas. But even Gary's work didn't include stormwater runoff Again, big issue in Portland, and it didn't include effects from climate change. But if I zoom in on this, so you can see that like this area right here, the orange represents the 100-year floodplain. The blue represents Gary's engineering approach of estimating depth of flooding that would occur during a 100-year flood event. And so people who are in this area, again, it doesn't account for climate change, doesn't account for stormwater flooding, it looks like this is an overmapped area that people are paying for flood insurance and they're really not at risk based on that 100 year flood event. And then if I go over here, you're seeing in this area where there are people who appear to be at risk but aren't in the 100 year floodplain. So an example of where just the signals and you know, you're at risk or not at risk um, seem not to be correct. Oops. So a little bit about these willingness to pay questions. So my field, environmental resource economics, there's a subfield called non-market valuation. And we use both techniques that look at um, marketed goods. So I do a lot of property value studies. So Jay mentioned that work. Um, I also do a lot of survey-based research where we're presenting respondents with hypothetical but realistic scenarios and then asking them questions that tease out their willingness to pay. And so in this case, we had a question where we put both individuals in our study area who lived in a 100-year floodplain and those who didn't live in a 100-year floodplain, we basically said, assume you're in a 100-year floodplain. And here are some characteristics about this flood insurance policy then we gave them a bunch of different numbers and said, tell us your maximum willingness to pay. Circle that number. And we were very clear to emphasize a couple of things, that you have to have flood insurance if you have a mortgage. It's typically not included in a homeowner's insurance policy. 
many people think that it is. Um, often what happens after I talk about this is almost everybody goes and they start calling their insurance agent and saying, does my policy include flood insurance? Chances are it doesn't. It's usually a rider that you have. We also tried our best, and this seemed to be the clearest way of articulating this, to convey what it means to have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. So that's what it means to be in the 100 year floodplain. So when we held our focus group meetings and we gave different options for how we could describe this, what we heard back was that describing it as, a, it's actually a greater than one in four chance that over the life of a 30 year mortgage, you're gonna have a flood. That's what it means to be in a 100 year floodplain. And we also made sure that people understood that they, the nature of the flooding is the shallow flooding, one to three feet. And so this is what we found. So the blue represents people who are in the 100 year floodplain. The green represents people who are outside the 100 year floodplain. But again, they were both supposed to answer this as if they were in the 100 year floodplain. And a couple of things jumped out to me. So one is that we have a lot of people in the 100 year floodplain saying, I don't know what my maximum willingness to pay is for flood insurance. These are people who are paying flood insurance. They know a lot about their flood risk because there's information that's sent to them every year by the city. You're in a 100 year floodplain. Here's how you can evacuate. Here's things that you can do. The other thing is that there's a skew. So when you look at the, the median for people who live in the 100 year floodplain, versus the median for people who are outside the 100 year floodplain, they have a higher willingness to pay. And so these are just our descriptive statistics. And what we did was we took this information and we did some more statistical modeling to see how this relates to various factors. So home characteristics, objective flood risk and subjective flood risk. And so this is what we found. So, here are estimates from our model. And we were thinking, well, there are lots of different ways we can model objective flood risk. We can model it based on you're in a 100 year floodplain. FEMA also breaks those 100 year floodplains into different zones. So AE and AH just refer to different projected amounts of damage that somebody would experience within the 100 year floodplain. And then this third one is that volume model that was based on the most recent state-of-the-art modeling of depth in your house of flooding in the event of a 100-year flood event. And it's hard to know, I mean, what objective measure of risk is going to be the best indicator. And so this is, in a sense, a sensitivity analysis. The results are not all that different from each other. But what I will highlight, and I'll just I'll focus on this one, is that when we predict willingness to pay, controlling for a variety of factors, consistently we were seeing that people in the 100 year floodplain were willing to pay more than outside the 100 year floodplain. But importantly, this is much less than what those insurance premiums are. So they're willing to pay something, but they're not willing to pay what the current premiums are in the study area. So in terms of our key findings, so there were other parts to this survey, including flood literacy, um, and when people found out they were in a floodplain. And that first one is something that really concerned us. And this is part of what motivated Representative Reardon to try and make floodplain disclosure um, more um, obvious or um, revealed to prospective home buyers a lot earlier. If you are buying a house and you're closing and all of a sudden somebody presents you with a bill and says, you're going to have to pay $1,000 per year for flood insurance, it could be that it just makes that home buying decision for you unaffordable. The Lentz and Powellhurst Gilbert neighborhood, these are a lot of first time home buyers. They might not have a lot of spare capacity for additional expenses, but you're at closing. What do you do? Um, and then we also found people were finding out they were in a floodplain after closing. This is way too late in the home buying process for people to understand the cost and also the risk. In terms of our modeling, we found people did not change their willingness to pay based on past flood experience. And I have some 
some thoughts about why that might be the case. It did increase if they thought that they were going to experience future flooding, and if they thought my home's flood risk is much higher than my neighborhood's. So that was consistent with what we would expect. We did drill into this question of race and ethnicity. So I mentioned we have a lot of um, recent immigrants living in the study area, a lot of non-native English speakers. And what we found was that willingness to pay was much lower for people who self-identified as Asian or people who said they preferred not to answer. And this raises questions because we've seen this in some other studies that certain race ethnicities um, end up having different willingness to get flood insurance. So it's a communication question. Is this clearly being communicated, the benefit of flood insurance, how you get flood insurance, and programs to help people make it affordable? Surprisingly, we found people who lived in the study area for a long period of time and who've seen these flooding events had much lower willingness to pay for flood insurance. You might expect that their willingness to pay would be higher. It was actually lower. And then just in aggregate, what we're seeing is this willingness to pay that it's 47% you know, to 59% of the current cost of flood insurance. So willingness to pay is much, much lower than what people would have to pay. I do wanna mention Portland, like many municipalities, participates in what's known as the community rating system. And so the insurance rates that I showed you earlier are actually subs they're 20% lower because Portland participates in the community rating system. So if I were to put this into the context of the full cost of flood insurance, it would actually be even lower than this. So forgetting the flood, um, people have a very hard time with low probability events understanding what that means. And you'll hear people say this, this gambler's fallacy. Well, it flooded last year. I'm good for another 99 years. And that's just not the case. Um, Houston is a great example. Three 500-year flood events, year after year after year. So that's a 0.2% probability of a flood in any given year. And they had that in, I think it was 2015, 2016, 2017. And so people don't understand probability. They don't understand this, uh, uh, this gambler's fallacy. It's just haunts a lot of people. We also see that a lot of people get flood insurance and then they drop it. It's expensive. And many of us are really thankful. Like I pay my house insurance. I pay my car insurance. I'm really, really happy if I do not have to call up my insurance company to file a claim. People, for some reason, feel very differently about flood insurance. They feel like, I've never filed a claim. This is unfair. They'll end up dropping it. I'm not at risk. Um, so we see a lot of people dropping these policies. It may be that people move, um, but it, it could also be that people are just dropping this because they've decided it's not worth it. Martha, I see you've got your hand up. Oh, you're muted, Martha. Okay, um, the question is about property tax. Uh, one of the things that if you get ruled that you're a hundred year floodplain, uh, one can argue that the overall basis of uh, the property value is reduced universally, um, which could be a compensation. Uh, what has been the history since uh, over this, um, this period of 50 years of, of property taxation with relationship to the the flood risk yeah oh that's such a great question so martha i did a study in the johnson creek watershed and i looked at the effect of being in a hundred year floodplain on property values and what i found was that it decreased property values by 21.5 percent so these homes and again part of the reason why people are um, they're moving to the lens area is that these homes are very affordable compared to the rest of Portland, they tend to be on larger lots because some of them are old farm properties, but um, they are at risk. And so part of what's going on there 
with those lower property values is a capitalization of those flood insurance premiums. Part of it also is people are at risk. And so to the extent that you, you know, look at a property and you're like, it's in a floodplain, I've got to pay more for flood insurance. Okay, so I'm going to pay less for that house. Plus who wants to deal with the hassle of being in a property that could potentially flood? I'll pay even less for that house. So that's some of what I think is going on when I estimated that 21.5%. I reached out to the county assessor and I've done this on multiple occasions. And I said, hey, county assessor, um, I'm doing this project in collaboration with the Portland Housing Bureau. Can you tell me when you're coming up with your assessed values, do you take floodplain into account? Crickets, crickets. I can never get them to respond to my emails, nor could my city contacts get them to respond to answer that question. So I think they're doing something. They're, they're basically, using a hedonic. So they're figuring out the different components of a home sale price and then doing some type of prediction. I just don't know what they're doing or if they're accounting for hundred year floodplain in there. I would love to know the answer to that question though, Martha. So thank you for asking that. I've tried. Did that address your question, Martha? Yeah, yes, thank you very much uh, yep. and good, good luck to you. Yeah. And if anybody's got insider information or knows somebody from the county assessor's office who would speak to me, I'd really appreciate that contact. Um, I related to that. So um, I mentioned the work that I've done in Johnson Creek. In other study areas, they actually find that home sale prices rebound quickly. So you'll have this catastrophic like hurricane flood event, home values go down. And like three to five years later, they just come back. It's like, maybe it's that gambler's fallacy, people forgetting the flood. I don't find that in Johnson Creek. And I really think it's because anybody in Portland, because it's nuisance flooding, it happens so frequently, you can't forget flooding in Johnson Creek. And maybe that's why it's just down and it always stays down. Jim, I see your hand. Hi. Um... I did some flood work in the Netherlands and uh, we were looking at the lek, and they found that they had uh, 300 year floods in five years. And their response was to say, you've got the definition of a hundred year flood wrong and to reassess the flood boundaries, which leads to my question is uh, how rapidly and how much are the borders for what constitutes an X year flood changing given that we have climate change on board. Yeah, so I've got your, and your, thank you. You're helping me um, motivate a couple of slides from now, but we, um, this, this is changing and you're right. Our flood maps are really out of date. They were supposed to be updated more frequently in the United States as part of um, the 2012, um, 2014 legislation. But like in Lenson, Powerhouse, Gilbert, they're really, really out of date. Um, but there's this change that's occurring with risk rating 2.0 that is going to dramatically alter um, how flood insurance and flood risk is communicated in the United States. So I will answer your question in a second. It might actually be the next slide. Yes, um, it is the next slide. Thank you, Jim. So when we asked our survey respondents um, if they thought that flood insurance was covered in their homeowner's policy, 40% of them said yes. And in fact, it's not covered in a traditional homeowner's policy. So people think they're covered and, and they're not. Um, the other issue is that the way that we have historically signaled flood risk in the United States is you're in a hundred year floodplain, you're at risk. You're outside the hundred year floodplain. You're not informed of that. You're not told you're in a 500 year floodplain or how far away you are from a 100 year floodplain. There's a building in New York City that uh, a foot of it was in the 100 year floodplain. And you're required to have flood insurance if your building is inside or intersected by a 100 year floodplain. And what the building owners did was they shaved off that foot. And they said, great, we don't have to pay flood insurance. But again, it's not that their risk went away. It's, it's just this problem of having this dichotomous, you're in or you're out. So there's an organization, um, First Street Foundation. And First Street Foundation is sharing a lot of their data with researchers. So I'm one of the researchers they're sharing this data with. 
And it's pretty exciting what they're doing. So they're bringing in the you know, very sophisticated um, modeling, climate change. They're doing um, not just um, fluvial flooding, they're doing pluvial flooding. So they're taking into account stormwater issues. And you can go on and I'll chat some of these, these links. You can go onto the First Street Foundation website and find your flood factor score. And I believe it's Zillow now, but if you look at your property, they'll actually have the First Street Foundation's flood factor score. Um, this is showing some areas like Portland, really, really undermapped with respect to flood risk. And there's a lot of controversy about whether they've got the modeling right or if they're um, not accounting for everything like green infrastructure in Portland. NFIP is also modernizing their rating system. So risk rating 2.0 is coming out. Um, August 1st, any of you who have flood insurance policies, you'll be able to figure out what your premium is going to look like. Um, we're going to see um, April 1st, 2022, people with existing flood insurance policies will be part of risk rating 2.0. And what it's going to do is it's going to tie insurance premiums to objective flood risk. So this is, in a sense, realizing what Curtillo was talking about, that we should have people facing the full risk of their decision. There are these changes that are occurring. And so if you just look and see what's going on in the news right now, um, there are a number of articles both talking about how this is gonna be fairer. So this I think is really going to help people in the Lentz and Powerhurst Gilbert neighborhood. Their premiums have been subsidizing people who live in far more expensive homes in um, coastal regions Florida is where most flood insurance policies are at. Um, we're gonna see some people with large increases in their flood insurance premiums. And so a lot of pushback from areas like Louisiana, New Jersey right now, Chuck Schumer for a while was um, really calling FEMA um, and NFIP to task for um, changes in the risk rating 2.0. So it's, it's becoming political again. In terms of policy implications, we just know climate change is gonna increase the risk of these natural disasters. And financial recovery, um, relatively few people, I think it's like 40% of individuals don't even have $400 in the bank to pull on. Um, so we have a lot of people who are financially vulnerable. And if they have a flood event and they don't have flood insurance, they're really gonna be challenged to respond to that. Um, the options are extremely limited and the dollar amounts are much smaller than what most people think. Um, localized flooding, it's not, you know, what happens in Lentz and Palhars Gilbert is never going to get a, a large disaster federal declaration. And so the remedy for people in those homes is quite limited. And what we saw it's just not being communicated to them the benefit of flood insurance, they don't understand what flood insurance is, it's not part of their homeowner's policy and their willingness and ability to pay for it is just really quite limited. So I'm gonna leave us with a bunch of questions. Um, is this a matter of just better communication and education? So what I have here, this came from one of my uh, agency contacts at the Bureau of Environmental Services who said, you know, this 1%, people need to understand like it's 1% or greater and that it varies from property to property. Sometimes it's gonna flood more frequently than that. Um, do we need to focus on better disclosure of flood risk? So should it just be mandated when somebody's selling a house, you have to reveal mm -hmm. flood risk, but maybe other um, potential issues related to your property, earthquake risk, landslide risk, wildfire risk. Do we need to just do a better job nationally of training insurance agents? stronger building codes, et cetera. Um, and you know, should we be doing something to help individuals move out of floodplains or a better afford flood insurance? So I'll leave you, this goes back to the uh, picture that I showed you of the floodplain restoration project on campus, which again, started in 2010. So I stopped by campus the other day and I took the updated picture and just to help you follow um, where, where we're at. So here's the, the same tree over time. 
So you can just see how dramatically over this 11 year period, um, this part of campus has changed where, you know, here's the original stream. You just, you can't see the stream right now. So we can, we can repair these areas, but um, there's, there's just no way, especially in my study area to do anything structurally to help reduce really that hundred year risk of uh, flood events. So thanks everyone. I'm really looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Natusel, uh, uh, Professor Natusel. Um, wonderful summary. Uh, 